Thank you very much. That was some very interesting information there. And if we actually draw this back to what we're talking about, the sector we're talking about, $1 billion goes overseas every year. Now, if we look at what does that mean in the context of corruption, which the, which the next presentation is on, it means that according to the basic statistics from the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, that the average organisation loses 5% of fraud, 5% of their revenues every year to fraud. Now, if we take that $1 billion and we take 5% of that, there's actually quite a large exposure to the amounts of money we're talking about. And we'll see that in a moment when we're talking about some of the areas that it's going to. So really, the, the purpose of the next presentation is to give you a little bit of, of an overview about corruption in the international development sector. And corruption really takes a number of forms. And I'm not going to define it. It's, a, you know, it's one of those things that, that it's difficult to, to define, but we all know it when we see it. Um, you've got a little bit of, of, of uh, examples up here. We've got a little bit here down the bottom. This is, this is talking about how, how uh, illegal funds and funds through terrorism funding in the context of extortion through bribes and what have you, flows through northern part of Africa. And how it basically is all interrelated in the context of funding illicit activities. We have money laundering. We have money laundering, which is a massive issue when we look at illicit capital flows coming out of Africa. There was actually one study which said, over a 20 year period, for every dollar that went into Africa, the same year, 80 cents flowed back out of the continent in the same year it went in, usually ending up in UK and Swiss bank accounts. And that's slowly changing over time. And when we talk about corruption, it's a little bit broader. We're not just talking about fraud. Fraud is a subset of corruption. We're talking about favouritism, nepotism, bribery, embezzlement. The list goes on. So what are, let's go through some facts and figures. And, and I'm not sure how many people uh, know this, but corruption is estimated to cost the world economy around 2.6 trillion a year. Now, if that was a business, it would make it the third largest industry in the world. And it's growing. The problem is not getting smaller, the problem is getting bigger. Now, if we look at that, and let's look at the impact on some of the countries we're, we're dealing with, and there's a, a very um, uh, much-cited report, which was done by the African Union, which basically said that 25% of Africa's GDP disappears to corruption every year. That's $148 billion. So there's a significant amount of funds that disappears every year. If we now look at the subset of that and we look at official overseas development assistance, 20 to 40 billion dollars is stolen each year of overseas development assistance. These are the professional development people. These are the old Ausades, the NURADs, the CEDARS, who probably are far more used to dealing with and putting processes in place to prevent corruption and fraud. So the problem is an extremely significant problem. If we look at the World Bank, let's look at the multilaterals now. We talked a little bit about the bilaterals. The bank, the World Bank is a bank. It has made a profit every, every year of its existence. But since it was actually set up in 1949, it has lost $130 billion of funds. And the bulk of those funds have been lost or misused, not at the point in which the funds were sitting in their bank accounts in Washington, D.C., but at the pointy end on the ground when the programs were being implemented. We've got to the point now where corruption is so significant it's interwoven into a growing number of societies and is a systemic feature of many countries. You will hear a lot of people say that to work in certain parts of the world, you can't avoid corruption. You can't avoid fraud. You must pay bribes. I don't personally agree with that. I think you're either part of the problem or part of the solution. 
you can get by in most places around the world with not being involved in corrupt behaviour. It's not easy, though. So let's have a look at this. This is, this is Transparency International's sea of, sea of Red. And what this means is this comes from their Corruption Perception Index, and it is a perception index. It's very important to, to note up front. And what this says is the darker red the country, the higher the risk and the higher the level of corruption that you'll be facing. There is a lot of dark red out there. We look at Australia, Australia's a nice yellow country, yet let's, let's not gild the lily here because Australia is no longer in the top 10 least corrupt countries in the world and has fallen three places in the last two years alone. So the issue is not just overseas, but the issue is also in our own backyard. Now I've overlaid on this areas, more problematic areas where there's conflict, where the risk of corruption is even higher. And if I overlay on top of that areas where sanctions may be in place, which again means that the corruption risk is even higher, then your risk profile in the context of sending funds overseas looks quite significantly red. And these are the issues that we have to be aware of. It's not simply a matter of our obligations are finished because we've transferred the funds to our partners. So what are some of the emerging trends and growing issues? The World Bank and the UN now see corruption as the greatest obstacle to reducing poverty around the world. The greatest obstacle. We have now seen it for the first time raised by an international leader when the UK Prime Minister a couple of months ago at a G7 made, I thought, a groundbreaking speech about how most of the problems of the current world that we face are rooted in the issue of high and growing levels of corruption. And it's about time that world leaders and the developing world started to take notice and started to take action. It's a cross-cutting issue. One of the biggest mistakes that people make about corruption is that they see it as a finance issue. It's not. The first line of defence in fighting fraud and corruption are your frontline managers, the people working on the ground, the people implementing the programmes. Not the back office people who are in there who put the appropriate controls in place. It's your front office people. So usually whenever there's discussions around corruption or fraud, most people say, oh, just a moment, let me go get the financial controller. That's their area. It's not their area. It's a cross-cutting issue and needs to be dealt with holistically. And one of the things we find that supports this is the one-size-fits-all approach does not work. Context is king. The way you will fight the issue in Africa is different to the way you would fight the issue in Southeast Asia or the subcontinent because it's a different type and a different style of corruption. Is it systemic? Is it opportunistic? So again, most of what you will see and most of the models that are pushed around is the Hong Kong ICAC model in 1976, which most of the Australian anti-corruption or the state anti-corruption models are based on. And it clearly shows that it works. It's the most successful model in the world. And to show you the impact that uh, s dealing with corruption can have in a developing environment is when they did a... Um, in, in the context of Hong Kong's 150 years history, the ICAC model and ICAC was voted by people as the seventh greatest achievement by the Hong Kong general public in the countries or the area's 150 years of existence. The seventh greatest achievement. So in this particular context, though, we have to remember it worked in Hong Kong because the environment made it appropriate. You had a strong level of political will. You had a strong viewpoint of wanting to stamp out corruption. That is not necessarily the case in many other parts of the world. So the point here is context is king. And what we are seeing here is that corruption in the not-for-profit and the charitable sector are on the rise. 
So, if anything, it's going to impact the charitable sector far more because the charitable sector, in many cases, falls through the cracks. They're not government. They're not business. And when we look at a lot of, when we talk about bribery and corruption, that is the focus in most cases. When I was running some operations for a large INGO in Malawi, all I had to do to satisfy the equivalent of the ACNC was to produce a set of audited accounts and a report and register it. In the six and a half years I was the country director, I didn't get a visit from anybody in the regulatory authorities. I didn't get any questions whatsoever. So in this particular case, while the legislation was there, there was no ability for the compliance to be followed up on. And this is a lot of the areas that you'll actually be working in. We also talk about corruption being culturally relative. It's not black and white. Every society is corrupt to a degree. And what I put up here is um, the term Katangali, which comes from southern central Africa. And what it talks about there is, is that the viewpoint of corruption is very clear. If I take some money and I keep it, I'm stealing and I will be dealt with, and I will usually be dealt with relatively severely. However, Robin Hood is alive and well because if I share the money and there's a redistributive element, it is culturally acceptable. It's frowned upon, but it's culturally acceptable. And there's a baseline survey that was done by the government of Malawi around about 2003, 2004, and it said that of 70% of every bribe, 70% is shared. So I take the bribe, I keep 30%, and that 70% then is shared round about 30% goes to my boss, and that's for protection, it keeps him or her happy, and the balance is shared with my colleagues and co-workers. Everybody is profiting. It's a very lucrative business, everybody is happy, it's not stealing. So corruption is not as black and white as we would like to think. There's a lot of shades of grey, and in different countries, there's going to be different viewpoints of what is and isn't acceptable. If we look now at the charitable sector, the charitable sector is even at more Check one. than a lot of other areas. And there's a number check of Check one, check one, check one, check one, check, check one. <laughs> there's a lot of uh, environmental risks that are inherent in the not-for-profit sector. And that's a tendency to be mission-driven. It's a wonderful thing to be mission-driven. But I've seen charities which are so mission-driven that sometimes the law doesn't apply to them. We are here to help the children. And it doesn't matter what we do because fundamentally, if what we're doing is helping the children, then that mission goes beyond those simple facts of maybe paying a bribe here, paying a bribe there, a little bit of grease here, a little bit of grease there. So this means at times governance in the broader sense becomes a little bit more secondary to the purpose for which some charities are set up. There's a high level of volunteerism. How many people do things for free? You will find in many parts of the world the concept of volunteerism doesn't exist. You may well, your, your delivery partners may well have volunteers. But they will expect something. And that expectation, the longer they're with the organisation, will become bigger and bigger. So again, an organisation which has a higher level of volunteerism, has a higher level of exposure. We also presume, well, everyone who works for an NGO and a charity, well, they're, they're naturally good people. It's another fallacy. The bulk, again, if we look at in-country delivery partners, in an environment where there are a few jobs, most people work for charities because it is a job, not because they necessarily believe in the cause. In many parts of the world, there are two key employers which keep economies going, and that are NGOs and charities on one side and governments on the other. So there are more and more risks because these are organisations who are seen to have the resources. Another point, we talked a little bit about it before, about not being subject to the same regulations as other 
parts of the sector, business, government. And what we're talking about here is that usually NGOs and charities are close to external forces. There are few regulatory environments and few regulatory uh, rules, processes and procedures that are put in place that charities have to follow in the countries that you're dealing in. And this basically means that there's an over-reliance on external audits and there's over-reliance on those charities and those NGOs putting in place their own systems. How robust are those systems? If you are working in a weak regulatory environment, then we have the added issue of either the regulations aren't there or if the regulations are there, are they able to be enforced? Is the equivalent of the ACNC in a lot of other countries, do they have the capacity, do they have the skill, do they have the resources to do what the ACNC does? Usually not. And again, if we look at that 5% that we talked about, $50 million potentially at risk, but we overlay it and look at some of the countries that this is going to, it's not 5%. It's significantly higher than 5%. So the first issue as a charity we have to ask ourselves is, and the first point that we have to understand is what is our corruption risk profile? And really this is made up of a number of different risks that we have to look at. And the first one is a geographic risk. Where in that sea of red is your money going? Are you ensuring then, if you're in a darker red area, that you're putting more appropriate processes and procedures in place? How well do you know your delivery partner? Does your delivery partner have those processes and procedures in place? Or do you simply rely on the fact that they do, and you know that once the funds leave your bank account, then you know they are intact? What is the programmatic risk? If you are dealing in an emergency relief environment, you will be facing major corruption risk issues. Because usually in those environments, no one is looking for three quotes. Nobody is looking for uh, all of these processes and procedures we put in place, which we call good governance or good internal controls, because there are starving people, there's victims out there that need to be helped immediately. So this is the most corruption prone. If you look and you're dealing then with community-based programs, that's the second one. If you're then dealing with schools or medical facilities, that's a very different than if you were, say, dealing in children's homes and orphanages. So again, understand the type of risks that are associated with the type of programs where you're sending your money to. Understand the sector and the environmental risk. Again, some sectors are more corruption prone than other sectors. If you're dealing in the medical centres, one of, one of the biggest issues around that is the buying and selling of drugs. Significant amounts of money are put into purchasing of drugs. But why is it that all of a sudden most of these countries or a good number of countries where we operate in, in certain parts of the world, despite all of these millions and billions of dollars that are sent in, they're still not sufficient in the country? So again, these are some of the areas that we have to look at. And this is over and above your internal risk. And what I've put up here is these, if we're looking at your operational or your general risks, these are your four key areas that you will find potential issues in your supply chain. Procurement, it's massive. So what processes do you have in place with procurement in country? What processes do you have in place around recruitment? If we are saying that corruption involves favoritism, nepotism, if you live in Africa, you will be told there is only one certainty in life, and that's family. An obligation to family extends and is stronger for the individual than the obligation to the employer. Misuse of resources. And beneficiary selection. How do you know your beneficiaries are genuine beneficiaries? I've been involved in a number of investigations across predominantly Africa. And in every single case, Beneficiary selection is a key issue. And in every single case, the programs that I've looked at or been asked to look at has involved a high level of ghost beneficiaries. Beneficiaries didn't even exist in the first place. 
How do you know the beneficiary is a beneficiary? How are your beneficiaries being selected? How are they being verified? And these are issues that there is an obligation in the due diligence process to be aware of. So again, there's no quick and dirty answer for this, but I think the key issue here is identifying your corruption risks and noting them down and putting risk mitigation strategies in place. And I'm not talking about a broad risk approach where corruption is just simply one line. And that one line and the risk mitigation strategy is, oh, we have a strong internal control system. It goes beyond that and we have to unpack it and break it down into the, into the key risks. So once we know our, our, our corruption profile, the next question is we have to know the main forms of corruption. And there's a significantly different amounts of corruption. There's one academic who's actually identified 160 different cases of or types of corruption. And again, the different types of corruption and the exposure to, to different types of corruption will differ depending geographically where you are in the world. In Africa, in most cases, corruption is opportunistic. Yeah. If you build in enough time in your schedule, you will be able to get around it. Expect delays. Have the courage to do it. If you are dealing in the subcontinent, it's far more systemic. And if we take, for example, India as a good example, they even now classify in India corruption as being honest corruption or dishonest corruption. Because in the good old days, there was only honest corruption. You paid your bribe and you got what you paid for. That's changing. People are paying bribes and they're not getting what they paid for. It's dishonest corruption. So it goes to show how some of these things can become so systemic, they're seen as part, integrated as certain parts of corruption is honest and certain parts of corruption are dishonest. When we're sitting here in Australia, there's no grey in that. It's black and white. So the next part is also be aware when you're dealing with putting your controls in place, be very much aware of how corruption usually is uncovered, as this will be an indicator for you around your internal controls. And what I've done up here is I've, I've, I've said fraud, because the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners do a study, a survey every year. They've done it over a large number of years. It's pretty consistent. And they review up to 1,500 actual cases of fraud. So they have a, a large repository of, of knowledge and trends as to how most frauds happen. So again, this is just looking at a subset of corruption. And again, the biggest one, whistleblowers, tips. The second one, management reviews. How many times in today's environment do we review the work of our people, our staff? Internal audit. So again, you have a gap there if you don't have an internal audit function within your internal control system. And again, an internal audit function is only relevant once you get to a certain size, but it picks up 14.1% of frauds. Simple account reconciliation. Bank reconciliations, that picks up 6.6%. Examining documents, 4.2, so we're getting down now to a little bit here. Out of the 7.1, you see two gaps here. External audit. 3%. 3% of frauds are uncovered by external audits. How many times have you heard, no, we're fine, we've been audited? I've been involved in a project that was audited four times by three different auditors. None of them found anything. Two annual audits, a program audit, a capacity audit, yet this particular program was fraught with a massive amount of fraud that none of the auditors picked up. And all the auditors confirmed the, inter the appropriate internal controls were put in place. And the reason I put that up there is if we look at, at the BDO review of uh, charities in Australia and New Zealand last year, oh, look at that. 83% of Australian and New Zealand respondents believed that their charity had a low fraud risk. Why? Because we were externally audited. Now, you have twice the amount of chance of 
picking up fraud within your organisation by accident than you do by an external audit. And if you read the fine line that your auditors will ask you to sign, the main purpose of an external audit is not to detect fraud or corruption. It is quite simply to state whether the accounts show a true and fair view. It is not around how clean is your organisation. Yet there is a perception out there that our partners in country, they give us regular reports, they give us external uh, orders. We visit them once a year. No, 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 we're fine, we're fine. That's not the case. So to me, this sums it up, and this probably gives you a little bit of an overview of the different areas that you need to work with. Corruption is much more prevalent in entities with poor governance, poor culture, dubious ethical values, a poor attitude towards internal control, and less than competent people holding key positions. So maybe you can take this away, look at your own charities, look at your partners you're dealing with, and how many of them fit into this. And these are the areas that you need to actually deal with when you're looking at putting in place the appropriate controls. So a good or a bad organisation, I have an example. If you were doing your appropriate due diligence, and this is what you came across, organisation had a code of ethics, code of conduct, disciplinary code, zero tolerance, anti-corruption policy, an independent governance committee from outside the organisation, a two-tier ethics committee, which is very rare, where they separate the investigatory arm from the adjudicatory chambers. So if you investigate it, it doesn't mean you determine what the outcome is. Disciplinary committee, audit and compliance committee, risk management system and a COSO-based internal control system, and COSO is the world's best internal control system, followed by the, your own compliance unit and extensive programs around ethics, and you are externally audited by KPMG. Who is this organisation? Any guesses? What would you think of this organisation? I'd be giving my money to them. <laughs> Looks can be deceiving. And if your due diligence review is a desktop review only, you may be giving to FIFA. A good organisation or a bad organisation? Potentially a bad one. Well, again, looks can be deceiving. Year three, the simple change was changing country director. There'd been no cases of corruption before that. Oop, problems. And what that country director did was implement and enforce a robust internal control system an accountability framework with a clear anti-corruption focus and all of a sudden, problems. There was corruption there all along. And the simple change here is the tone set at the top and a change in, a in, a change in personnel. Strong political will commitment at the top, a risk-based approach, use of hard and soft controls, genuine enforcement of zero tolerance. Zero tolerance is zero tolerance, people. There's no such thing as a degree, and if someone stole $10 or someone stole $10,000, the result is the same. Do not implement a zero tolerance process if you don't intend to follow through on, on it. So start corruption proofing your organisation today. And there's three questions I think you can take away from today and ask yourself. Do you know your corruption risk profile? Do you really know it? It's not something necessarily that most people would be able to have the background to do. But it's a key point you must be aware of if you're sending funds overseas. And do you have the appropriate risk mitigation strategy in strategies in place? Not only what is your risk profile, what is your partner's risk profile in country? Do you have an anti-corruption framework and an integrated corruption prevention and control strategy in place? Spending money on anti-corruption issues is not an overhead. It is part of good programming and should be included as a programming cost. It is not an overhead. And how well do you know your delivery partner? How well do you really know them? What due diligence have you carried out? So a final thought from me, and then I think my time is over. There is not an organisation in my experience working in the international development sector who doesn't have a problem with corruption. Some may hide it better than others, but it is a major issue even for the big players.
And as we say before, you need to view anti-corruption as a program-related cost, not as an overhead. And finally, we all know that donors give to us based on the level of trust in us. So how confident are you that the funds given into your care really are being used for the intended purpose? Because if you're not sure, then there is a fiduciary obligation on you to act now. Ignorance is not a defence. And the growing body of legislation growing up around the world on anti-corruption clearly says ignorance is not a defence. So I hope you've uh, enjoyed or appreciated a little bit about me sharing anti-corruption with you.